Hello everyone and welcome to video number five in the history of paleontology where we're going to be looking at some key developments in the last century of this science. I wanted to start off though by highlighting a quote from a play that I rather like by Alan Bennett called The History Boys because I think it reflects well the process of having to write this kind of lecture and especially this particular video for this lecture. So that quote is, but this is history, distance yourselves. Our perspective on the past alters. Looking back, immediately in front of us is just dead ground. We don't see it. And because we don't see it, that means there is no period so remote as the recent past. And one of the historian's jobs is to anticipate what our perspective of that period will be. And I think that is very much what I've had to do here. I would say that in the last century, work in the field of paleontology has become more collaborative it's groups of people and a bit less iconoclastic. There are less individuals necessarily driving particular fields forward. And that means that that, accompanied with the, the kind of the ever increasing number of people working within this and associated subfields, makes charting a clear history very, very difficult. Things are more about the appearance of fields, as you will see, than they are about particular individuals. And so when I've written this, what I've done is just chosen some particular topics that I think are probably important and they make a nice narrative. Other people may choose other things that have happened in the last hundred years to illustrate um, the developments in paleontology. So do bear that in mind as I go through these examples. The first example of an important discovery um, is the um, discovery of DNA. And I think this is really, really valuable because DNA um, has allowed us to have insights um, to uh, the dates of the origins of groups, for example, using an approach called the molecular clock, and have provided complementary um, forms of data to um, fossils and morphology to understand macroevolution. And indeed, up until this discovery occurred in the 1950s, this was a really obvious problem. People knew heredity happened and had known that for quite a long time but the exact structure of the informational molecules that did it was not known. All that was known by uh, the 1950s was that whatever these were, they were found in the nucleus. There were two competing teams that were studying this question in the late 40s and early 50s. One is from King's College in London, led by Maurice Wilkins, shown on this slide here, um, with his colleague Rosalind Franklin, um, shown here. The other was uh, Watson and Crick, who were two scientists at the University of Cambridge. And the discovery is really quite well known and charted in, in the history books. So essentially what happened is Rosalind Franklin, who was collecting data with her PhD student, student Raymond Gosling, um, asked Raymond to give Wilkins, this gentleman here, the image of an X-ray um, diffraction pattern um, that was collected from analyzing DNA that you can see on the the right-hand side here. It's a very, very famous image. Wilkins showed this image to Watson and Crick, and Crick and Watson were mobilized into building the model of DNA that you can see here, and which we now know to be the structure of this very, very important molecule. Watson and Crick proposed that double helix model for DNA, and with Wilkins, they won the Nobel Prize um, for the discovery of DNA in 1963. By this point, uh, Rosalind Franklin had died of cancer um, and was thus not eligible for that PhD because um, she had a habit of standing in the way of X-ray beams during her work, which probably contributed to the ovarian cancer that she, she ultimately died from. But this was a really singular discovery that unlocked lots and lots of mysteries um, in as to how um, life evolves in deep time. It has given rise to a field that we may want to call molecular paleobiology, so looking at the molecular remains of either ancient DNA, proteins, or amino acids, and, of course, using DNA to understand evolution in deeper time, and gave birth to entire other fields in life sciences, such as bioinformatics, so really, really important stuff. I think another important um, kind of uh, development in the last hundred years is a move towards quantitative approaches in paleontology. An example of this um, builds off the work of J. John Sepkowski Jr., shown on the right-hand side here with a fantastic dog whose name I don't know. I can only apologize sincerely for that, um, but I'm sure they're very famous as well. 
and David Raup shown on the left hand side here. And what these two guys did for my example is they counted up occurrences of different forms of fossils and then mapped them through geological time and did quantitative analysis of that, showing, for example, big dips in the diversity of fossils representing our important mass extinctions and helping us to understand some of the sources of biodiversity. And indeed, this thing that you can see here is now called a Sepkoski curve. This was just one example of a movement towards using analytical statistical approaches to understand fossils. And this is ultimately the source of quite a lot of um, kind of paleoinformatic type work that you may come across today. And it was also kind of reflected in a paper by Stephen Jay Gould I've put on this slide um, that was trying to move paleontology towards a, a discipline where we define universal laws and then we test those and we test hypotheses. So I think this movement um, is a really interesting and an important one for us. And it has, got, of course, gone hand in hand with some of the other developments that I'm about to talk about. Another thing I thought was worth mentioning is the advent of kind of like a, a more um, distinctive form, a well-defined subfield called paleobiology. Now, the phrase paleobiology is quite an old one. It's been used for a long time. However, my feeling, looking back at the papers and science from the 60s and 70s, is that this label gained popularity and gained a stronger identity of its own as a subfield during those decades. As the name might suggest, this paleobiology stresses the biology, sometimes that will be the physiology or the ecology of fossil organisms and also their ecosystems. The latest 1960s through the 1970s definitely did see an active push for people who wanted to understand fossils not just as things in a rock but as living, breathing animals. A really obvious example of that is a movement that's sometimes termed the dinosaur renaissance. This was a movement in which a number of paleobiologists pushed for a rethink of how we consider dinosaurs. A famous member of this movement was John Ostrom who argued very strongly that birds that we see today wandering around outside and flying as well had evolved from within the dinosaurs. Another key player was his PhD student, Bob Backer, who pushed for people to think of dinosaurs as warm-blooded, highly active animals, as opposed to, I suppose, the reptilian, cold, lizardy creatures that people tended to think about them as before that point. These developments in dinosaurs were paralleled in a whole range of other areas. And I think that momentum built up to the point where there was a, um, a journal that was launched called Paleobiology, on the, the, one of the early issues is shown on the left-hand side here in the 1970s, showing the kind of solidification of this field. And a textbook um, with the name Paleobiology was first published in the 1990s. So it was a, a, a real um, kind of... Um, a change in the zeitgeist, kind of a change in how people viewed paleontology in this subfield of paleobiology. And if you want to get a, a feel for the state of the fi this field in the late 1980s that kind of reflected these shifts and how it revolutionized how we view fossils, you can look no further than the Lost Worlds and Vanished Lives um, documentary that David Attenborough did in 1989. And if you're based in the UK and have a TV license, you can watch this for free. It's only four episodes. It's pretty cool. I rather enjoy it. Um, on BBC iPlayer. So if you are able to, and you, you are interested in this particular period of history of paleontology, do check that out. Another subfield that I think is of note is taphonomy. So I've kind of pictorially represented this here. Taphonomy is basically the study of the um, preservation of fossils and the, the, the mechanisms by which that occurs and indeed the impact this has on our picture of past life, as represented by this um, famous painting of Pope Innocent X and the Francis Bacon on the right-hand side here. So taphonomy has really been studied for as long as we have thought about fossils, but the name itself was co co coined, I should say, in the 1940s. And I think it, most, it solidified into its own subfield, arguably um, most obviously in the 1970s, a famous proponent of it is Adolf Seilacher, who I've, whose name I've put on the slide here. He undertook a systematic effort to formalize this field and add some structure to it and to um, make it into the scientific field that it is today. 
that was accompanied and has been built upon slightly later by the increasing use of experimental approaches uh, looking at things as they decay. Um, some obvious players in this were Derek Briggs, who I will mention in the next slide as well, and a gentleman called Peter Allison, who's now based at Imperial College in London. So taphonomy today is a rich and varied field that looks at how fossils form. Another important development that happened, uh, I guess, in the 1970s and the 80s was the work of this trio here. At the top here, you can see Harry Blackmore Whittington, who was a professor of paleontology based in the University of Cambridge. Bottom left, you can see Derek Briggs, who I mentioned um, just a short while ago, who was his PhD student. And in the bottom here, you can see Simon Conway Morris, who was also um, Harry's PhD student. And this, this trio led to a renaissance in the study of the Burgess Shale, uh, an early Cambrian um, series of rocks that are found in Canada with some amazing fossils, such as those ones that are shown on the right-hand side here, found inside them. This renaissance in the study of those fossils was very much couched in developments of the time. Um, and ha as a result, they very much focused on what this event can tell us about evolution broadly and indeed what this event tells us about the history of animals. But it led to this renewed interest in invertebrate paleontology about these major events and led to a number of um, kind of long-running uh, debates, I will say, which weren't as kind of um, uh, as strongly fought, possibly as those 19, sorry, those 1800s ones, but are, are very similar in other ways. So uh, one of these is based on the work of these debates about the Cambrian Explosion was based on the work of Stephen Jay Gould, who's shown here in the middle, who also worked on the Burgess Shale fauna. And he wrote a series of popular science articles defining these things as weird wonders, or kind of, I say, defining them. That's not really the right word. He kind of made the case that these aren't are just weird animals that um, reflect very much this time period. Uh, this Cambrian fauna, he used as an example of, of the role of contingency in the broader pattern of evolution. It just so happens that things that are alive today are, are, are here by chance, and they are very much the pattern of what survived through the Cambrian. In contrast, Simon Conway, Conway Morris, who I mentioned on this slide here, um, wrote another popular science book, this one called The Crucible of Creation, that stressed that those members of the Cambrian fauna that resemble modern taxa and probably were precursors of the modern taxa. And it's one example of how um, these, these kind of debates about the nature of evolution, the nature of fossils, have continued to this day. But the reason that I wanted to highlight Stephen Jay Gould is because also he made important contributions to our pictures of macroevolution. One of his most famous was done alongside Niles Eldridge, who's shown on the left-hand slide of this here, slide here. And this, um, their idea was this idea of punctuated equilibrium that's represented by these two evolutionary trees up here. Up until um, the work of Eldridge and Gould, um, people viewed evolution through the lens of this thing that we could call phyletic gradualism. It's slow and it's steady, and morphologies gradually change through time in response to drivers, and nothing happens really very, very fast. Well, there's a slight sting in the tail of that in that some biologists did have an idea of rapid changes um, in response to things, but generally this, shown on the top right, was the pervasive view. These two gentlemen um, came up with this idea called punctuated equilibrium, where they made the case that actually e uh, that evolution is the majority of the time defined by stasis. No changes in morphology is represented by these lines. If you look, there's time on the y-axis here and morphology on the x-axis. These lines that are almost vertical represent long periods with very little change, right? Um, and then they made the case that these long periods of stasis are punctuated um, by rapid changes that reflect evolutionary innovations or, um, or other um, events happening. And so this is a very um, different view of evolution, which is very much based around um, sudden changes in groups splitting. And it has led to a, a, a long debate amongst paleontologists about the nature of evolution over deep time. Um, uh, I think in the world of biology, um, it's quite hard to test these ideas, and so um, the idea of punctuated equilibrium does not necessarily hold 
um, hold its own nowadays in the world of um, kind of biological studies of evolution. But when we're looking at the fossil record, we do see lots of stasis and lots of sudden changes. So paleontologists still talk about this quite a lot. Maybe I'm doing them a disservice there, because I suppose there is still quite a lot of debate about the nature of punctuated equilibrium. So let's move on to the, my final slide. So most recently, and this is so recent that I've generally avoided naming names or indeed giving you much more information, I would say that computers and computational approaches have revolutionized paleontology. These revolutionary um, changes include the development of digital tools that have impacted upon quantitative paleobiology. Often, for example, as you can see in other um, videos that I've created about, say, paleoecology, these use the programming language R to do analysis of fossil occurrences in a big scale to look at the patterns and the processes of evolution. So computational approaches have revolutionized or expanded, extended, expanded the scope of these quantitative paleontology approaches. Similarly, computers have allowed us to use both morphology and DNA to build evolutionary trees, as you can learn about in the phylogeny videos. So this computational approach is really good when it comes to trying to understand how organisms are related to each other using whatever kind of data you're interested in doing that. And also, in recent years, the development of X-ray techniques such as high-resolution CT scanning or computed tomography alongside digital visualization, and this book is all about these things, um, has allowed us to see fossils in three dimensions using X-rays and digital technology in more detail than we ever could in the past. That has really allowed us, when it comes to paleobiology, to better understand the physiology of long dead organisms. And all of that is represented by Sandra Bullock in this 1990s movie, The Net, which is available on Netflix at the moment if you so wish to watch it. And all of that brings me to the end of my videos on the history of paleontology. I hope you found them interesting and that you've uh, learned some stuff from them. Um, there's lots more out there if you want to learn about how paleontology as a science has built up today. But this was, I th hope, a worthwhile introduction over the course of um, uh, just under two hours to get you started. So thank you for watching all the videos if you got this far. And yeah, see you around. <laughs>